Good evening and welcome to our Maundy Thursday service. I want to start out with some scripture, first of all, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 26, through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, he proclaimed the Lord's death until he comes. Now this is, uh, without skipping, uh, we'll go right to John chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Well, as scripture proclaims, when Jesus wanted to give his followers a way to understand what was getting ready to happen to him, he didn't give them a theory, nor did he give them a theological dissertation. But actually, what he gave them was an act to perform, to participate in as well. In fact, here specifically, Jesus gave them a meal to share. And it's a meal that on a more personal level speaks more volumes than any theological thesis or manifesto actually ever could. Well, today, if you haven't guessed, and maybe I said it at the top, I'm not sure, but today is what the church calls Monday Thursday, which is think about it, kind of, a, kind of a funny name. We were just singing a song earlier, which not was disrespectful to the name, but singing a song that had that name in it. But regardless of that, this is a day in which is always celebrated as a remembrance of what happened right before Jesus was arrested and ultimately crucified. Now, the word mande is, is actually a Latin word, which means mandate or commandment. And so in that respect, it is something that Christ has commanded us to do, such as what? Love one another, or go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or as Christ did on this, his final night on earth, he, he took the bread, as we just read, he gave thanks and he broke it, and he gave it to his friends and said, this is my body giving, given to you, do this in remembrance of me. Or in other words, do this and it will help you remember me. You ever thought about it that way? He does that so we will, it will help us remember who Christ is and what Christ did. You see, Jesus knew how easily the human mind forgets. Matter of fact, Brian Dalton and I were talking this week about how our minds as we're getting older are kind of slipping into the abyss. How we can be in mid-sentence and forget you know, what, what the next, like right now, like the next thing you're going to say, or for me, I, I, won't, I won't say that for Brian, but we can enter a room and we may forget why we were even there. I do that more, than, more often than I would like to admit. And so Jesus knew how easily that we forget things, right? I mean, it's almost as if the rush of time kind of deletes our memory banks, if, if you will. So yeah, Time can be like a sponge on a chalkboard, kind of wiping the memories away that we have there. And so what Jesus was basically saying here is that in the rush, in the stress of life, all those things flying at us at, at one time and, and from all different directions, directions, chances are in those moments sometimes we will forget who Jesus is in our life. And so from a shared meal, Jesus is showing us that somewhere deep in the human psyche, there's this neurological link, <laughs> imagine this, between food and memory, where these, these special food triggers, if you will, these distinctive tastes or smells, uh, many times they're, they immediately morph us back to a different time, to a different memory, something that's very special to us. I mean, maybe for you, these favorite foods remind you of where you used to live at one point in your life. It certainly does that for me. Or maybe more specifically of the person who prepared said food or drink for you in that moment. For example, for me, to this day, every time I uh, have a country ham biscuit, and I don't care about the cholesterol and all the bad things in country ham, I love country ham. I'm not going to stop eating country ham. It's like bacon for many of you. I like bacon. I like pork. Okay, I'll just say it. I just, I, there was an admission for me this morning. I like pork. But country ham biscuits... 
to me take me back to a time when I used to go to my maternal grandmother's house because she always had a fresh plate made for my grandfather. And when we came, she knew how much I loved them. She would take them out of the cabinet. If you remember one of the first sermons I delivered, I talked about going to my grandmother's house every single Sunday. We'd watch Lawrence Welk and the Mutual Overhaul, Overhauls, Omaha's Wild Kingdom, that show. You remember that? Well, those were the moments where I enjoyed those country ham biscuits. So that, would, that always takes me back to the presence of my grandmother and my grandfather in that setting. And so when these familiar foods or drink are in front of us, the memories of another time and place or space, whatever, kind of come flooding back in a very nostalgic and familiar manner, which are often filled with joy and comfort and consolation for what you were going through at that time. Therefore, you see, you, you see for humankind, it's so easy for us to live our entire lives in a haze of forgetfulness, where we kind of miss the why and the what of what we've already learned up to that point. And so this shared communal meal is so vital, so uber important for our spiritual memories, really. Or as the biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann, a, a Duke guy, he once said, one of the most important things in being a Christian is to practice memory in a world of amnesia. And so, yeah, the Lord's Supper is a very important way or command from Jesus, as we just read, that uh, Jesus has given us where our consciousness will come alive to the reality that inside Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, right through to his resurrection, now we have life, and now we have purpose, and now we have hope, and we have love. And so as we end uh, our serv the services in the, uh, this evening, uh, at least the part I'm, we're doing right now, I want to conclude by reading a short story by one of my favorite authors, who is uh, Henry Nowen. Um, this is an allegory, but I think you'll, you'll catch what, I'm, uh, what I'm, I'm sending your way here. This is story time, boys and girls, so enjoy this. It says, once upon a time, twin boys were conceived in the same womb. Weeks passed by and the twins began to develop. And as their awareness grew, they laughed with joy and said, isn't it great that we were conceived? Isn't it great that we are alive? The twins explored their world together and they found their mother's cord that gave them life, and they sang for joy. How great is our mother's love that she shares her own life with us. Weeks stretched into months, and the twins started to notice just how each of them were changing. What does this mean, one twin asked the other. It means that our stay in this world is coming to an end, the other one said. But I don't want to go. I want to stay here forever, the first twin replied. We don't have a choice, said the other. But maybe there's life after birth, the other one said. No, we will shed our cord. How is it possible that we will live without it, replied the other. Besides, we've seen evidence of others who've come before us and gone on. Yet none of them have come back to show us that there is life beyond. No, this is the end. And so the other twin fell into deep despair, saying, If conception ends at birth, what's the purpose of the womb? It's meaningless. Maybe there's no mother after all. But there has to be, the other protested. How else did we get here? And how do we stay alive? Maybe she's just a figment of our imagination. Maybe we made her up because the idea made us feel good, the first twin said. And so their last days in the womb were filled with deep questioning and a lot of fear. Finally, the moment of birth arrived. And when the twins had passed on from their world, they opened their eyes and cried for what they saw exceeded their greatest expectations. Folks, this is just a reminder. I think this, it it's kind of starts with this evening that life is a gift. We understand how precious life actually is. In fact, none of us are, not to be morbid, but none of us are guaranteed one minute more in this world. Because as scripture says, life is a mist, it's a vapor, it's a flower that blooms and then fades away and dies. And so as we remember and come to terms with the reality that life is a gift from God, it is so important for us to wrap our minds around the fact that while we're still here, Jesus has given us an act to perform, something to do, a meal to share, an opportunity to love radically and unconditionally. And so as we prepare ourselves in this posture of sharing, where the sublime moments of communion from years gone past really kind of come flooding back to the forefront of our memories. Let us be mindful 
of how the beauty of God's grace and mercy and love for all of us came clearly into focus on this Holy Thursday 2,000 years ago, where Christ loved his friends, and us really, loved us enough to share a meal in a conversation and laughter and tears and reminiscing with them really one last time as he stepped closer to finishing that race. Let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, on this, uh, on this holy, holy night, as the church celebrates what you did for us on this uh, Holy of Thursdays, thank you for your sacrifice. I just pray that uh, we don't waste this, that we do understand the urgency of, of life, how short life actually is. And that the opportunities we have today may not be there tomorrow. May, they may look a little different. So I, I pray that we do something with that today. Understanding this sacrifice came for us. And it would have come no matter. It would have come no matter who it was. If it was just one of us here, you still would have done that. Lord, as we're sharing a meal, as we share in a few moments in, in Holy Communion, I pray it takes us to a place, maybe at the time we were baptized, or if we were baptized as infants, take, it takes us to our confirmation. Some moment in the church life, in the years gone by, where there was someone there, someone said something, spoke a kind word to you, where Christ actually moved in their lives, and it made a difference, and maybe they forgot that. They forgot what that felt like. They forgot how, how great a place a church family, a church building full of the church family can actually be. Maybe some who are listening today have fallen out of church and, and they're suspicious as I was for the longest time about church and what the motives are. I pray they know that this place, as Spindell Methodist, is, is, is really a church family who loves Jesus first and foremost and loves each other in the same way. So Lord, as we share this meal tonight and as we share subsequent meals and days and weeks and months to come, I pray it all, always the focus is on you. As those memories come flooding back of times we've shared with you, and with other loved ones, that there will be great memories. And from those memories, there will always be hope. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Jesus prescribes in this scripture, uh, I think it's a beautiful thing. If you think back about the, the family table and what that looks like for you, maybe been over a holiday, if you're still living at home, maybe every night, I'm not sure. But some special memory for you has been shared over food or drink in the past. And as we've said through this talk tonight, it was Jesus' intention, in part, for them to remember, to go back to what that meal meant. The last time they were able to sit down in that context pre-crucifixion and have a meal uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we think about it in that context, as we're sharing this tonight, and it was virtually, we'll get there in uh, just another few days now, it's, it's, it's Monday, Thursday, but we'll see you on, on Easter. We'll, worship, we'll be sharing communion together that day. But I pray in whatever shape or form you're doing this tonight, that it will take you to a place in, in your faith life, in your church life, in your life altogether, where Christ will speak to you profoundly as you remember what that meant for you in that moment and what this means for you now. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread after he blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to his best friends and said, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of the vine. After he blessed it, he gave it to his best friends, his buddies. He'd spent three years with and said, take, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink. It's the body of Christ broken for us and is the blood of Christ shed for us. God bless you on this Monday, Thursday. Have a great week. <laughs>